Hello, my fellow forgiven sinners. Grace and peace are yours from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Last time, we focused on the Israelites wandering through the wilderness, and we noted that uh, we are in a very similar situation today. Uh, that spiritually, we are wandering through the wilderness. Well, today, we're going to go through the book of Joshua, and we continue to notice some similarities. As Joshua led God's people to conquer their enemies and he ushered them into the promised land, so our leader, Jesus, brings us victory against our spiritual foes and he will usher us into the promised land of heaven. Uh, God himself almost makes this uh, very same point for us um, since Joshua and Jesus are actually the same name, one being in Hebrew and one being in Greek. Uh, both names mean the Lord saves. Like the Israelites long ago, no matter what stands in the way of God's promises to us, God makes us more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Before we start, uh, I think it's valuable for us again uh, to think about the violence that we read about in this book, uh, in these sections. Uh, many of us today, uh, especially those of us who have uh, maybe had the luxury of never uh, being a victim of violence, uh, we are shocked to read uh, about things like the Israelites' uh, conquest of Canaan. Um, and how, how bloody that was. Uh, like we said, when we looked at the flood earlier in this series, uh, this is a place for us to remember what God's justice look like, looks like. Um, and for us as sinful human beings, it should be terrifying. Uh, this is what the, the, the word of God has to say to wicked people and under God's law, every single one of us is wicked. The scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death. Uh, and we should be uh, rightly terrified of what our sins deserve. We each of us deserves destruction because of our sinfulness. And that perspective ought to lead us uh, through to faith in Christ, that we might live lives of gratitude for the many mercies that God shows to us every day, the fact that he does not treat us as our sins deserve. And it should also lead us to a life of repentance so that we do what is right rather than continuing in our evil uh, as if it were not an issue, as if it were not something uh, important. Um, that said, the book of Joshua begins with the Israelites preparing to enter into the promised land. God spoke to Joshua to encourage him. If you read that section for yourself, it may strike you how many times God says to Joshua, uh, be strong and very courageous. Uh, the Hebrew culture liked to repeat things uh, way more than we do uh, in their speaking um, and in ours. Uh, but it, may, it does make us wonder, though, uh, if uh, perhaps Joshua uh, himself uh, particularly struggled with fear. Uh, but as God spoke to Joshua, uh, he recalled his promises to Israel, which uh, he was about now to fulfill. Uh, he told Joshua that he would be uh, with, jo or with Joshua, just as he had been with Moses. Uh, and so he commands Joshua to carefully follow all of God's word, especially what was written in the book of the law, uh, which you and I know today as the five, uh, first five books of the Bible. Joshua gets the people ready uh, to enter into the land, uh, but he sends in two spies. Uh, it's possible that uh, Joshua didn't want a repeat of the 12 spies that we read about last time uh, that happened before the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, uh, but he sends these spies in secretly to Jericho, which was the first city they would need to conquer as they entered into the land. Uh, so the spies, they go into Jericho, and when they get there, uh, they go to the house of a prostitute named Rahab. Um, possibly they had some sinful motives. Uh, it's, un it's not clear. Uh, perhaps they had other reasons. Uh, maybe they thought this would be a good place to hide. Who knows? Either way, it worked out for them. Uh, Rahab uh, told the spies that she and everyone else knew that God was with the Israelites and that he was going to give them this land. Uh, they had heard of the many victories, the military victories that God had given to the Israelites earlier. Uh, and so the people of Canaan, uh, they were all terrified. They knew that the Israelites were coming and that the Israelites were going to win uh, these fights. Uh, so for this reason, Rahab actually wants to join the Israelites uh, and she's allowed to. Uh, she hid the spies, uh, helping them out and uh, got them back to their place. Uh, and they promised that they would spare her and anybody that was in her house with her. Uh, so her family with her. When they came to conquer the city, the spies agreed that they would uh, protect Rahab and her family. The spies then returned uh, to Joshua with this good news that they were set to uh, inherit this land as God had promised. And Joshua continued his preparations for conquest. Uh, first, the Israelites had to cross the Jordan River, and in a way that maybe reminds us today, uh, maybe reminded the Israelites back then, um, God uh, had them cross, or reminds us and the Israelites of the crossing of the Red Sea uh, about over, over 40 years ago, uh, God 
here at this point, as they are crossing the River Jordan, uh, God stops up the water, uh, the river, uh, so that the Israelites are able to pass through on dry ground. And then after the Israelites had all passed uh, to the other side, the river continued its flow again. Uh, Joshua, before they did cross all the way uh, there, he had he paused and grabbed, um, had them take uh, some stones from the riverbed uh, and set up an altar so that future generations would be able to remember this uh, historic moment. After that, we read that the Israelites, the Israelite men uh, needed to be circumcised. Apparently, they had not practiced this while they were wandering in the desert. Kind of a curious thing there. Notice that the Israelites are in kind of a weird place here. Right? They're just about to go to war. Their enemies know they're coming. Uh, and as they're going to war, they first block off any chance they have of escape. Right, They're on the other side of this Jordan River. And then they pause to do surgery on all the fighting men so that they have to sit recovering for a few days. Seems like uh, they're leaving themselves wide open to an attack, right? Uh, but in this case, faithfulness to God's will is the priority. It's a higher priority even than their own safety. Uh, and this was this is their trust in God being shown in action, right? Uh, at this time, there is a fascinating moment before they do begin this battle with Jericho. Joshua is alone. He's all by himself, and he saw a man. Joshua asked if the man uh, was for them or for their enemies. But the man said, neither. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Those are some powerful words for us to consider, especially as we make all kinds of us versus them narratives in our day. It's, it's very easy for us to pick out enemies, people that we are against and people that are against us. As for the Israelites back then, so for us today. The question is not whether God is on our side or on their side. The question is whether we are on God's side. This fits very much with Jesus' teaching in the Gospels that we are to love our enemies. From a worldly standpoint, that sounds absolutely crazy, right? But God shows us that the real enemy is sin and Satan. So, for example, say I have somebody who has wronged me in my life and I seek revenge on my human enemy. But if I do that, I've really only fought on the side of sin. I have forgotten the real enemy. By enacting revenge, I've actually joined the side of the real enemy. Fighting on God's side means remembering who the real enemy is and keeping our human fights in their proper place. Back in Joshua, the Lord explains to Joshua what the battle plan for taking down the fortified city of Jericho is going to be. The Israelites would march around the city of Jericho, the massive walls of this city, for seven days. And on the last day, they would march even more. And then they would make some noise, yelling, blowing trumpets, and those thick, uh, heavy walls of Jericho would simply crumble to the ground, giving Israel an easy victory over that otherwise fortified city. But as the spies promised, Rahab and everyone in her house were spared. Uh, at one of the next battles, we again see God holding the Israelites to a very high standard, as he has been doing all through this time. Again, not whether the question is not whether God is on our side, uh, but whether we are on God's side. And commonly in that day, part of the value of going to war was the spoils. When you conquered someone else, you got to keep all their stuff. But in these cases, God told the Israelites that they were not to do that. They were not to keep any of it for themselves. They were to destroy everything, giving it over totally to God. Uh, they were to keep nothing for themselves at all. However, one man named Achan disobeyed. He did take some of the plunder for himself and for his family. Uh, Israel attacked a city called Ai, but they lost. And so they're trying to figure out why was God not with us as we went to this battle? And Achan was discovered. Uh, he was killed then for his sin. Israel again went to fight Ai, uh, but this time the Lord was with them and they defeated Ai. Uh, they used Ai's overconfidence from their previous victory. They lured them into an ambush and swiftly defeated them. After this, Joshua set up an altar on Mount Ebal. And he read the book of the law to the Israelites. He kind of pauses for a, a quick worship service. Interesting there. Uh, but rather a long worship service because they're reading the whole book of the law. Later on, one of the Canaanite tribes, Gibeon, uh, not to be confused with uh, Gideon, who we'll hear about next time, uh, Gibeon, they tricked the Israelites into making a peace treaty with them. They pretended to be from very far away. They wore really old raggedy clothes. They took moldy old bread with them so it looked like they had traveled a long distance. And they pretended to be not one of the Canaanites that Joshua was supposed to destroy. And so fooled, Joshua ends up 
making a treaty with them without consulting with God. Joshua later finds out his error. He finds out they're actually Canaanites. He was supposed to destroy them, but now he had given his word. And uh, you'll, you'll notice this throughout the Old Testament, especially people are really concerned in these books about keeping their word. If I said I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Today, we, we kind of had the opposite idea, right? If, uh, if I don't feel like I, you know, gave my word in, in a proper context or whatever, or if I just don't feel like keeping my word, <laughs> I'm going give, to give it up. But in this case, yeah, they, they were going to keep their word because they had made a treaty. Um, and so after hearing about this treaty with Gibeon, uh, five of the other Canaanite kings joined forces to attack Gibeon. I guess they're, they're angry at him or, or whatever it is. Uh, Gibeon uh, then calls to Israel for help, and the Israelites come to their aid. They fought off the enemies all day, and God gave them great victory, and God even stops the sun in the sky for a full day uh, for the, so that the Israelites could press their attack uh, and, and get a full victory over their foes. After this, we read that Joshua conquered the southern lands of Canaan and the kings uh, of the north, then form a giant alliance against Israel, kind of this final assault against them. <coughs> they come out against Israel with this massive army. Uh, the book of Joshua says they were as numerous as the sands of the seashore. And God spoke to Joshua before the battle. He again calls him uh, to not be afraid. God promised uh, Joshua victory by that same time the next day. And sure enough, God does give the Israelites full victory. Uh, Joshua, uh, we read, was careful to do everything that God had commanded him. And so after many battles, after many losses, many hardships and struggles, the Israelites finally did conquer the promised land. They divided up the uh, lands uh, for each of the 12 tribes. And God had fulfilled his promise to bring them into this promised land. Uh, after all this time then, Joshua, by then a very old man, he calls Israel together to make a farewell speech, much like Moses had done before him. He reminded Israel of the great things God had done for them. He called them to be faithful to God's covenant with them. He reminded them that God had promised great blessings if they are obedient to God's word. And, he, and God also warned that there would be great curses uh, if, they, uh, if they rebelled against God. He reminded the Israelites uh, of their history, of Abraham of their time of slavery in Egypt and of their wanderings through the wilderness. He reminded them of this great conquest that God had given them, this new home that God had brought them into, and he made a covenant for the people reaffirming for them the laws and decrees of God. The people promised then that they would be faithful. After this, we read that the Israelites returned to their newly established homes uh, in this promised land. Uh, Joshua then died and was buried. The book then closes with a few notes. Uh, but especially we read that Israel was faithful to the Lord during the life of Joshua and also during the lives of the elders that ser had served with him. As we said at the beginning, Joshua serves as a reminder of our far greater hero, Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul reminds us that we are in a war, but it's not against flesh and blood. We instead war against the rulers, authorities, and powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Like the Israelites before their uh, 40 years of wandering, these enemies seem insurmountable. Many give up. Many wonder why we have to fight in the first place. They forget that we're in a battle. Many would rather just die in the wilderness like the Israelites talked about. But let that not be you. Remember that we are at war. So stand firm in the word and in the sacrament. Put on the full armor of God, as Paul says. Grow in those spirit-worked virtues that our God grants to us. Virtues like faith, hope, and love. And remember our great champion, Jesus. Just as God brought people victory through Joshua long ago, God brings us victory through Christ. He will settle us in our promised land of heaven. And until we have that victory, keep up the fight. Amen. And I say, I say, I say, it can't be that easy. And he said, he said, and no, it wasn't easy.